Welcome to the online training on antimicrobial resistance. This training has been designed for the members of the Kenya Pharmaceutical Association by the Ecumenical Pharmaceutical Network. Please watch this training file carefully. There will be a short assessment at the bi-monthly meeting on the 21st of November 2015. Note that this training will earn you three CPD points upon passing the assessment. During this training, we will discuss the background and history of AMR. We will describe the mechanisms and factors that drive antimicrobial resistance. We will discuss the cross-cutting problem of AMR and describe how we can address AMR in the pharmacy setting. What is antimicrobial resistance? AMR can be defined as the ability of microbes to grow in the presence of a chemical, either a drug or a medicine, that would normally kill them or limit their growth. AMR makes it harder to eliminate infections from the body because the existing medicines become less effective. AMR is a public health concern. This has been shown by the emergence of a multi-drug resistant TB, multi-drug resistant malaria, and drug resistant HIV and AIDS. And the threat of antimicrobial resistance is not just focused on bacterial infections, but we can see the, um, the viral infections, parasitic infections, are also implicated in this. Apart from uh, resistance emerging to viral, parasitic, and bacterial infections, we also have uh, enterobacteriaceae that produce enzymes that can destroy or reduce the effectiveness of antimicrobial agents. In 1928, Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin while working with Staphylococcus bacteria. He noticed that a type of mold growing by accident on a laboratory plate was protected from and even repelled the bacteria. This active substance, which Fleming called penicillin, was literally an antibiotic. In 1941, human studies on penicillin began, and the production efforts grew to the point where adequate supplies became available by 1944 and Fleming received his Nobel Prize for his work on antibiotics in 1945. And by the end of the World War II, penicillin had become widely available and had won worldwide acceptance. Two years after he received his Nobel Prize, physicians observed the first case of antimicrobial resistance to penicillin. Six years after the human studies began. And the prevalence of resistance varied between geographical regions and over time. Fleming, in his Nobel Prize lecture, himself had warned of the danger of resistance. And he said that it was not difficult to make microbes resistant to penicillin. All it needed was exposing them to concentrations that were not sufficient to kill them and this same thing has occasionally happened in the body. And by exposing these microbes to non-lethal quantities of the drug, eventually makes them resistant. This is a chart showing when an antibiotic was discovered and when the first cases of resistance occurred. Tetracycline was first introduced into the market in 1950. And by 1950, 59, resistance to tetracycline had already been reported. Erythromycin was introduced in 1953, and by 1968, strains that were resistant to eryth erythromycin had been reported. For gentamicin, the first time it was introduced into the market was 1963, and in 1979, resistance strains to gentamicin had already been reported. It's easy to see 
that the occurrence of new resistance has been increasing over the last years. And it takes a shorter time between the time a drug is introduced into the market for use and the time that resistance is reported. There are several reported cases of drug-resistant TB across different regions globally, and the trend has increased over the last 10 years. Looking at the time period between 2005 to 2012, we can see that the trends of the emergence of drug-resistant TB has increased. One could argue that we only need to develop new antibiotics to combat the emergence of resistance. But what data is showing us is that this is getting harder and harder over time. The antibiotic pipeline is dry. There is a dramatic decrease in antibiotic drug approvals. Looking at the chart from 1983 to 87, we had about 16 new antibiotics being approved in comparison to less than two anti anti antibiotics being approved over a period of four years between 2008 and 2012. AMR is a steadily increasing global public health threat. Infectious diseases kill approximately 10 million people annually, and 95% of these live in, in resource-constrained countries. Antimicrobial resistance is widespread both in the hospital and other community settings. And this is a challenge because major life-saving interventions for infectious diseases is actually pegged on antimicrobial treatment, which should be effective. And this is further aggravated by the shrinking range of av available antimicrobial drugs in the market. Antimicrobial resistance is rapidly making many first-line treatments ineffective, and in some cases, the second and third-line treatments are also becoming ineffective. And as a result, there's a negative impact in the management and treatment of infectious diseases, including HIV, TB, and malaria. Looking at the global burden of infectious diseases, 15 million infectious disease deaths occurred in 2002, and this is according to the WHO report for 2003. And all the top five diseases that caused death were infectious diseases, and most of these can be treated with antimicrobials. And in regard to antimicrobial resistance, if these trends increase, then the number of deaths due to infectious diseases are likely to rise. There are global reports of increase of resistance to various antimicrobial agents. Some examples from Kenya and data indicate that there is an increased trend of resistance to commonly used antimicrobial agents that are also affordable. Taking an example of amoxicillin, one of the most widely used antimicrobial agents in Kenya, which had recorded minimal resistance in 1996, almost at 0%, but by the year 2002, resistance had risen to levels of 65%. Other studies have been carried out in food handlers in Nairobi hotels that have indicated pathogenic E. coli detected among 4% of those that were sampled, and the majority of those that were sampled had strains that were resistant to tetracycline. And 40% of these sampled food handlers had multi-drug resistant strains. Why are we concerned about the food handlers? We are concerned because of the courage of multi-drug resistant toxins by this population. And this is a public health concern because trans transmission can occur from this seemingly safe um, uh, population 
to other people and this can further aggravate the spread of antimicrobial resistance. Looking at studies that have been done for trimethoprin, sulfamethoxazole resistance on patients who have been put on daily prophylactic therapy, especially those that are taking antiretroviral agents. Some studies have indicated a baseline prevalence of the presence of um, resistance to cotrimoxazole ranging from 71 to 81%. And for those who take cotrimoxazole daily, the resistance increased significantly from 78 to 98%. So why are we concerned about this? We understand that cotrimoxazole is one of those drugs that forms a backbone in the management of HIV and, and AIDS. And we need to know that daily prophylaxis with cotrimoxazole can actually induce in vivo resistance to the drug after two weeks of administration. Further studies have been carried out on Salmonella typhi isolates from outbreaks in Kenya over a 20 year period. And these isolates were studied for antimicrobial resistance. The results indicated that there's been a dramatic increase in the number of multi-drug resistant Salmonella typhi. From the samples, 60% of those that were isolated and subjected for antimicrobial susceptibility were found to be multiple drug resistant to commonly used drugs like ampicillin, chloramphenicol, tetracycline, and cotrimoxazole. 22 percent were resistant to single antibiotic treatments like ampicillin, um, cotrimoxazole, and tetracycline again. It's important to note that resistant organisms can be transmitted from one region to another because resistant organisms that are identical to Southeast Asia organisms have been identified and this has actually suggested an intercontinental spread of single multidrug resistant clones. Given the emergence of these aggressive MDR organisms, careful selection and monitoring of antibiotic use usage will be required in Kenya and potentially other regions in sub-Saharan Africa. From the observations, we can conclude that antimicrobial resistance strains are able to multiply in the presence of drug concentrations that are higher than the concentrations in humans receiving therapeutic doses. It's important for us to note that each introduction of a new antibiotic has been followed within a few years by the first cases of resistance. And it's also critical for us to note that the trend in AMR is steadily increasing in every country in the world and to every antibiotic that has been developed. For us to appreciate antimicrobial resistance and to fight the emergence and spread of resistance, it is important for us to understand the mechanisms of antimicrobial resistance. And this can be ideally attained through two mechanisms. One is INET or intrinsic, and these are specified by naturally occurring genes that are found in the host chromosome. The second mechanism is acquired, and this involves the transfer of resistant determinants or genes that are born on plasmids or bacteriophages and other mobile genetic material. And the transfer of this genetic material occurs through conjugation transformation and transduction pathways. And we're going to look at each of these. In intrinsic or innate mechanism for antimicrobial resistance, 
the microorganism can either destroy or inactivate the antimicrobial agents. The, anti, uh, the, the microorganisms can also have efflux systems that will effectively pump out any antimicrobial agent that gets into their systems, or the my, microbes can undergo DNA mutation and ideally evade any targets that the drug could be uh, utilizing to kill the microorganisms. In acquired antimicrobial resistance, there is gene transfer from one cell or from one organism to the other. And this can either happen through conjugation, transformation, or transduction. In destruction or inactivation by the microorganisms, many bacteria have the ability to produce enzymes that will chemically degrade or deactivate the antimicrobial agent. And this if effectively renders them ineffective against the bacterium. The antimicrobial agent is either degraded or modified by enzymatic activity before it can reach the target site and damage the bacterial cell. A good example is penicillinase, which is produced by staphylococci that degrades penicillin. The other mechanism which is effective for the microorganism is the efflux system, where the bacteria through a channel termed as a porin can pump back out the antimicrobial agent by the efflux pump. Bacteria increases efflux to prevent intracellular accumulation of the antimicrobial agent necessary to exact their lethal activity inside their cell. Membrane permeability can also be altered through regulation of porins which are the gates into a cell. The next mechanism of resistance is mutational resistance. And mutation is literally a change in the DNA. And this can sometimes result in a change in the gene product, which is the target site for the antimicrobial agent. So if the target site changes, then the antimicrobial agent is not able to exact its effect. It's more like changing the lock and using the same key to open a door. The next level of resistance or acquisition of uh, resistance is acquired resistance. And this can happen in different ways. And normally would occur by gene transfer. And this involves the transfer of resistance through mobile genetic material. And this can occur via conjugation transformation or trans 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 transduction. The DNA material is shared by a plasmid which is moved from one cell into another. In conjugation, two cells are normally in close proximity to each other and there is a hollow bridge-like structure which is known as a pilus that forms between the two cells. Bacteria would form a bridge through which a copy of the plasmid bearing the resistant, mole the resistant gene is passed from the donor to a recipient. Plasmids generally carry the genes that confer resistance to antimicrobial, antimicrobial agents and therefore any susceptible bacterium can acquire resistance. And this may be the mechanism for enterococcal resistance to vancomycin. In transformation, 
the transfer of a naked DNA from a dead bacteria to other bacteria in close proximity occurs. And the living bacteria is able to incorporate the resistant gene into their own DNA. Some of the free DNA may contain advantageous genes such as antimicrobial resistant genes and may benefit the recipient cell, essentially making it resistant to similar antibiotics that it might be exposed to. For transduction, bacterial DNA is transferred from one bacterium to another inside a virus that potentially infects bacteria. And these viruses are referred to as bacteriophages or phage. And the DNA that's transferred from one bacterium into another may contain resistant genes. There are eight factors that are major drivers of antimicrobial resistance. For example, inappropriate use of antimicrobials, the use of antimicrobial agents in animals, poor infection control practices, inadequate surveillance for antimicrobial resistance, poor quality of antimicrobial agents in the market, inadequate and weak regulation and enforcement of laws, weak pharmaceutical management and drug promotion. For the inappropriate use of antimicrobials, we know that antimicrobial agents are one of the most widely used and misused agents. Antimicrobial availability is also increasing. This has been facilitated by recent global health initiatives like the Global Fund for AIDS, TB and Malaria, the US presidential initiatives, all which have come in to support public health uh, initiatives or diseases that have been a priority. And uh, up to 50% of human use of antimicrobial agents is unnecessary. Studies have indicated that every second patient in acute care hospitals receive antibiotics. And 30 to 60% of patients who've been given antibiotics in primary health care could have been unnecessary. This is perhaps twice what would have actually been required. Inappropriate use of antimicrobial agents occurs at different levels. At the prescriber level, the dispenser, and at the patient or consumer levels. There are three main groups that influence the inappropriate use of antibiotics. And these have been attributed to prescribing, dispensing, and consumption. Prescribing unnecessarily for antibiotics has been attributed to wrong diagnosis, which can be a, as a result of lack of knowledge or inadequate information for the prescribers. This would result in either an over or underdose or a wrong drug. For dispensing, either too much or too little of the prescribed drug can be dispensed. Inadequate information for the person who's carrying out the dispensing process. Poor training. Lack of the recommended or required drugs can also result in inappropriate use. For the consumers, lack of information can result in an over or under use of antimicrobial agents. Lack of information can also result in uh, using the drug when it is not required. Financial constraints play a big role in impacting antibiotic use.
because the patients or the consumers would want to use what they can afford. Multiple prescribers can also result or contribute to unnecessary consumption of antimicrobial agents. At the prescriber level, the misuse of antibiotics has also been reported. For example, in the treatment of diarrhea in public and private sectors, not all diarrheal cases are of bacterial origin. And when managing diarrheal cases, standard treatment guidelines need to be followed. And diarrhea should be treated with oral rehydration salt as often as possible. It is important to note that antibiotics and antidiarrheals are not the first choice for the treatment of diarrhea. And from the studies that have been done, what has been found out is that compliance with guidelines is very low in most public and private facilities, and most times the wrong treatment is prescribed. What are some reasons for irrational prescribing and dispensing? Like we mentioned earlier, training deficiencies, diagnostic uncertainties, unavailability or underutilization of standard treatment guidelines or formularies, the fear of poor patient outcomes, and the need for self-reassurance by the prescribers would lead them to unnecessarily prescribe antimicrobial agents. Some prescribers fear litigation and some also have no access to microbiological information that can guide the selection of the proper antimicrobial agent. And some prescribers also give in to patient demands. Some are under economic incentives from the drug manufacturing companies. And this is a negative influence on the prescribing practices. Prescribers are also under pressure from peer groups, either the prescribing or the pharmacy advisors. They are under pressure from the patient or parents' demands. They are also under pressure from hospital experts and Regulatory and control mechanisms also influence their prescribing practices. Looking at the misuse at dispensing and the consumption level, we know that antimicrobial agents can be purchased without a prescription in many resource poor countries. And we also know that patients tend not to finish their course of antibiotics. And more often than not, antibiotics are used for viral infections, such as common colds, coughs, or sore throats. And this all adds up to misuse of antimicrobial agents. It is important to let the general public know that antibiotics do not work on colds. Apart from inappropriate use in human beings, there is also rampant use of antimicrobial agents in animals. 50% of the antimicrobial use in developing, developing countries is actually attributed to animals. And 40 to 80% of this animal use is highly questionable. Why are we saying this is highly questionable? Because antimicrobial agents are not used for treatment of infections in animals, but are rather used for the prevention of the, of the occurrence of infection. And it is important to note that irrational use of antimicrobial agents in animals can contribute to resistance in human pathogens. This is because bacteria can be easily transmitted into animals and the animals can pass the resistant genes to animal, 
to animal to the animal's flora and this can be transmitted to humans via the food chain the other major driver of antimicrobial resistance is the lack of infection prevention and control infection control is key to reducing the spread of antimicrobial resistance there is lack of or poor adherence to effective infection control protocols. If infection control is adequately practiced, then infections will not result and the demand for antimicrobial, antimicrobial agents will reduce. Common modes of transmission of infections include hands and medical devices. And transmission does not just, trans uh, uh, does not just include the transfer of microbes from one person to another, but it also includes the transfer of multi-drug resistant organisms from either the patients to the healthcare workers or from the healthcare workers to the patient and eventually into the community. And up to 10% of admitted patients get hospital-acquired infections and 60% of these hospital-acquired infections are drug resistant. The other major driver for antimicrobial resistance is poor regulation and enforcement. And this is characterized by the lack of proper control of supply, distribution, and sale of antimicrobial agents. And this can be seen through the sale of antimicrobial agents in unofficial retail outlets or even street vendors. And when antimicrobial agents are sold without a prescription or sold in incomplete doses in most pharmacies, that is actually a breach in law and a breach in the requirements for dispensing antimicrobial agents. The other major driver of antimicrobial resistance is the presence of poor quality antimicrobial products in the market. Counterfeit and substandard drugs that lack the stated active ingredient or contain the rock active ingredient or even have insufficient levels of active ingredient contributes to antimicrobial resistance. The US FDA has estimated that up to 10% of drugs worldwide are counterfeit and in some countries more than 50% of the drug supply is fake. And this takes us back to our definition of antimicrobial resistance. When microorganisms are exposed to sub-therapeutic levels, this actually encourages the development on, and the growth and multiplication of resistant strains, which ultimately will result in treatment failure and poor patient outcomes. Inadequate surveillance is an important driver for antimicrobial resistance because when surveillance is not done, we know that they, there's going to be inadequate data to guide policy, to guide the use, and we cannot be able to measure the impact. The quality and dependability of data can be a concern even where this is available. And this is because we do not have a standardized reporting system for suspected cases of antimicrobial resistance. If a patient, for example, returns with a medication and says it did not work, what happens or what is the role of the healthcare provider who comes into contact with this particular patient. In the best case, the patient is sent back to the doctor. But sometimes, the staff just changes the antibiotics or gives a higher dose without proper evidence on whether or not that antibiotic is effective or they will require an alternative. So surveillance needs to be carried out within the hospital and in the community to inform best practices.
the final driver for antimicrobial resistance is poor pharmaceutical management. Deficiency in pharmaceutical management manifests in many ways. For example, inappropriate selection and use of antimicrobial agents. And this can be attributed to the lack of policies and guidelines, like standard treatment guidelines or essential medicines lists, and inadequate pre- and in-service training. If drugs are not appropriately selected, then the wrong drug is likely to be prescribed for an infection. Apart from inappropriate selection, undependable supplies can also drive inappropriate use of antimicrobial agents and eventually contribute to antimicrobial resistance. More often than not, health workers will dispense an antimicrobial agent not because it was prescribed but because that was the best available option for that particular point. And, and this is um, a direct uh, reflection of the pharmaceutical management systems that are present in a facility. And in addition to the inappropriate selection and undependable supply, poor storage practices can compromise the quality of antimicrobial agents present in a facility. And this can also drive antimicrobial resistance when the quality of uh, the active ingredients is compromised. Medicine advertising and promotion also plays a big role in the prescription and dispensing of antimicrobial agents. And this can occur at via direct to consumer advertisements, which allows the marketing of medicines directly to the public. This should be discouraged because the public can make a choice that is not informed because of the limited knowledge that they have. And again, there is a stimulated demand for the latest medicine, not necessarily the most effective in terms of um, cost and availability. Pharmaceutical promotion also increases pressure on prescribers because this largely targets the prescribers. And the, the pharmaceutical companies use a host of incentives to motivate the prescribers to prefer the latest medicine. And these incentives come in the forms of gifts or free samples or even offering to support speaking in engagements for the prescribers. And this does not necessarily translate to appropriate use, but because of the incentives that the prescribers have received, they will tend to prescribe a particular molecule because of what they will get in return. So after covering all this knowledge, what can we be able to do at a facility level to contain antimicrobial resistance and reduce the demand for antimicrobial agents? We can be able to put in place mechanisms that can contain antimicrobial resistance. For example, we can activate our medicines and therapeutics committees so that we are able to make the best choices and judgment based on evidence. We can put in place infection prevention and control measures to reduce incidence of infections that would ultimately reduce the demand for antimicrobial agents. We can also make use of standard treatment guidelines because standard treatment guidelines are developed based on evidence and this would be the best possible options that patients can get for any condition that is diagnosed. We can also stick to the essential medicines list. This ensures that we appropriately use what has been recommended for certain levels of healthcare. And finally, 
we can utilize our microbiology laboratories. Without functional microbiology laboratories, it will be very difficult to appropriately prescribe and dispense the best choice to achieve our optimum patient outcomes. What can we do? What can we do at our own different levels? One, don't accept to sell antibiotics without a prescription. Even if the patient insists on antibiotic treatment, remember you are the medicine expert. It is our responsibility to counsel the patients and inform them on the dangers of inappropriate use of antimicrobial agents. Always counsel the patient correctly. Let them know that antibiotics do not help with viral infections and give them suggestions of what can help alleviate the symptoms. Promote the right hygiene and encourage hand washing amongst your colleagues, patients and family. This will help reduce the spread of infections and ultimately reduce the demand for antimicrobial agents. Remember to check prescriptions for the right dosage, for the right treatment duration, and possible interactions that can affect outcome. If a patient has been started on an antimicrobial agent, the course has to be finished unless there is an allergic reaction or anaphylactic shock occurs. In case of ambiguity, always remember to contact the prescribing physician and encourage the patients to return if the treatment is unsuccessful and report suspected cases to the prescriber and the in charge of the pharmacy outlet. Is there more that we can do at an individual level? Yes. We can engage ourselves. Depending on your workplace, encourage your superiors to form a medicines and therapeutics committee and be a member of the medicines and therapeutics committee. Promote compliance with the available standard treatment guidelines. Encourage the procurement of safe medicines that are of a high quality and ensure that these are procured from secured sources. And find other ways to fight AMR as you go along the way. Thank you.